Text and Logo, Chafee College. Wignall Museum of Contemporary Art. A graphic of a house appears. Text, Home Edition, Artist Talk, Anla. April 30th, 2021 from 2 to 3 p.m. PDT. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us at today's program featuring artist Ann Lee, presented as part of the Wignall Museum's Home Edition. A video conference of four people appears. Home Edition is a series of curated artist talks, workshops, and discussions featuring artists and cultural workers. One speaker's video fills the screen, with a kitchen in the background, fills the screen. Text, Rebecca Trawick. My name is Rebecca Trawick, and I serve as the director and curator of the Wignall Museum. The Wignall Museum is a teaching museum and interdisciplinary art space that introduces Chafee College students, faculty, staff, and community members to innovative contemporary art objects and ideas. By fostering critical thinking, visual literacy, discourse, and empathy, the museum seeks to enhance the intellectual and cultural life of our community. Text, Wignall Museum. To learn more about native land acknowledgement, Please visit https colon slash slash usda c slash native land. https colon slash slash native dash land dot ca. We want to take a moment to recognize that we are situated on the Ranch Cucamonga campus of Chapey College, which resides on the traditional and unceded lands of the Tongva people. We offer our recognition and respect to the elders, both past, present, and future. A speaker with a blank background. Text Roman Stallenberg. And hello, my name is Roman Stallenwerk. I'm assistant curator at the Wignall Museum. Text, Wignall Museum, with a web address to programs and recordings. Visit us at www.chafee.edu slash Wignall to access our full schedule of programs and available recordings. When possible, recordings are made available on our website. Announcements post to our email subscribers and social media when new videos are available. All recordings on our site include captions and audio descriptions as options. Text, receive announcements about our programs. Subscribe to our email list, www.chafe.edu slash wignall slash about dash us dot php. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, at Wignall Museum. You can follow us on social media, including Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, at Wignall Museum. Visit our website About Us page to sign up to receive email announcements. Text with a link to the survey. We also ask that you complete a brief survey after the session at tinyurl.com slash Wignall Spring 21 Visitor Survey. Thank you. A speaker with a digital background of the Wignall campus. Text, Andrew Hadel. Hi everyone, my name is Andy Hadel. I'm the preparator at the museum. Text, this program is a 32 minute presentation followed by questions and discussion. In a moment, Ann Lee will present for about 30 minutes or so with the remaining time being available for Q&A. The four speakers appear. Thanks, Roman. Thanks, Andy. So today I have the pleasure of introducing our guest artist, Ann Lee. Ann Lee received her BFA from Cal State Fullerton and her MFA from Cal State Long Beach. Lee's work explores identity, culture, family history, and the duality of becoming Vietnamese American in her work. Inspired by the cultural context in her life, Lee correlates the artificial with remembrances of generational trauma. Sentiment is vital in her work as she questions her personal experiences to construct imposing art. She excavates her lineage by revisiting her family's experiences by using personal and found images to reconstruct slippages in time and history. As layers of images are stacked upon one another, Lee travels through time, commenting on the idea of home, displacement, separation, and how we embrace and conquer loss. Tragic and poetic composites are pieced together to unravel narratives which places her Vietnamese American perspective into a contemporary landscape. Ann Lee was born in San Diego, California and currently lives and works in Los Angeles, California. So please join me in giving Ann a warm virtual welcome. Thanks, Ann. A speaker in an office with a filled bookshelf and framed posters leaning on the floor. Text, Angela. Hi. Hi. Uh, thank you for having me today. Um, I kind of lost my voice Wednesday, so I'm taking it easy. Hopefully this, this sound sounds okay. Uh, but yes, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm just going to get right into this. I'm going to get right into this lecture. I don't know if it's going to be 30 minutes. It might go over. So I'll um, skip some slides as we, as we go along. I, um, I always over-prepare for a lot of things, so... Bear with me, bear with me, please. Okay. All right. Zoom. You know, I really do love Zoom. It's 
The platform's really cool. Slide. Two photos beside a small caption of social media text. The first photo depicts an adult and child with packed bags standing outside the United States Embassy in Vietnam. The second is a family standing with packed bags. Okay. I created this, this presentation about a month ago, um, and I just added this slide this morning uh, because today is a really... Today is a very important day in Vietnamese American history where April 30th, 1975 was the fall of Saigon. And um, I follow this uh, new wave documentary on social media and they just have a lot of pertinent information uh, about uh, Vietnamese Americans, Vietnamese that have been dispersed all over the nation. And I just wanted to share this slide with you. Um, I'm thinking about like how young, like how young Vietnamese people um, are in America. We're about 46 years old in the, in the United States. Slide. A photo of Anna holding a protest sign with text, Vincent Chin, and his photo. The photo is part of a Los Angeles Times article. All right. So, uh, I, again, I created this slide about a, uh, this PowerPoint about a month ago, and um, I went, I'm going to segue like just directly into, into my most current works. And uh, I made a few collages in response to the happenings or the shootings that happened in Atlanta um, with the spa. And I went on a stop, stop Asian hate rally in West Hollywood with the collage that I've created, which uh, caused, I didn't cause, which picked up traction with the LA Times. So here is an image of myself and the signage that I've created um, with the, this, this current body of work entitled um, Model Myth. Slide. Text from the article beside another photo of Anla in the same clothes, holding the same sign, but now a crowd has formed nearby. And I'm not the type of creative to uh, work simultaneously with, with the news that's happening in the world, but I needed to kind of like dump that energy and that like sadness and anger from my process before starting new work. So that, that, that's the way that I process information and energy. Slide. A photo of Anla with her sign beside other protesters with signs beside a newspaper clipping. It was also printed in the LA Times the following morning. Slide with a title, Model Myth, 2021, with small text. So I'm going to get into, again, my most current works, and it's, it's three collages entitled Model Myth from 2021. And uh, I'm just going to read you this information. A model minority is a minority demographic whether based on ethnicity, race, or religion, whose members are perceived to achieve a higher degree of socioeconomic success than the population average, thus serving as a reference group to outgroups. This success is typically measured relatively by educational attainment, representation in managerial and professional occupations, and household income, along with other socioeconomic indicators such as low criminality and high family marital stability. Slide. Model myth. Vincent Chin. 2021. Art collage. Two cross sections of Vincent Chin's smiling face are pasted on top of two slivers of two different white men. Text describes the image. This was the first collage that was created. And if you, uh, I make note to myself, this was made, made on March 20, March 17, 2021. Um, I leave myself so many notes because I forget so many things. But this is entitled Vincent Chin. And this collage is about Vincent Chin, a Chinese American man on um, June 19th, 1982, with beaten to death with a baseball bat in Detroit, Michigan, by two white men frustrated with the U.S. auto industry's troubles. The two were sentenced to three years probation in order to pay a $3,000 fine, two civil rights trials, and a civil suit followed, but neither spent a day in jail. The Vincent Chin case serves as a wake-up call to address anti-Asian bias and racial tolerance. As I was walking through the rally, there was this older gentleman on the sidewalk he yells out, who's Vincent Chin, right? And I think, oh, yes, remember those exact words. And when you get home, Google it, because there's a documentary entitled, Who's Vincent Chin? Okay. Slide. Uh, Model myth, Stockton schoolyard shooting, 2021. A photo of the top half of a young child's face to the nose pasted to an upside-down cutout of another photo of the top half of another child. 
The two halves cover a man's face, though his hair, ears, and neck are visible. Text describes the image. Model myth, this is a socket collage entitled Stockton Schoolyard Shooting 2021, January 1989. Among the fatalities were Rathanon or age nine, Graham Chun, age eight, Sokyum on age six, Un Lim, age eight, and Tui Tran, age six. They were Cambodian and Vietnamese immigrants who came with their families to the U.S. as refugees. The gunmen, who had an extended criminal history, shot and killed five school children and wounded 32 others. His victims were predominantly Southeast Asian refugees. The attack was a U.S. non-college school shooting with the highest number of fatalities and injuries until the Columbine High School massacre. Of all U.S. school shootings in the 80s, it had the largest number of victims. So these are all appropriated images from the web that I've deconstructed and reconstructed. Slide. Loan words, 2021, with the definition. I'm going to segue. So I'm just going to show you a few, a few pieces from my current works. This is a body of work entitled Loan Words. Loan Words. <clears throat> the adaptation of French loan words in Vietnamese. Due to the influence of France, while Vietnam was a French colony, many French words have been adopted by the Vietnamese. Slide. Bomb. Bombay. Bomb. In Vietnamese. French and English. The three translations of the same word appear superimposed onto a grayscale image of bomb smoke billowing. Text describes the image. I realize that I am a research type of person where uh, when an idea comes, I immediately go and research that idea before it just like leaves my mind. And um, uh, yeah, most of my works are like information based and then the collage comes. So this, bot, this image is entitled bomb, 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 bomb in Vietnamese, French, and English. And this here is note to self, time, timeline of colonization and war and thinking about my parents. And I, I feel like I, the, the majority of my work is made through thinking about my mom, thinking about my parents, thinking about um, all of the Vietnamese uh, refugee families that have been dispersed like all over the nation. Uh, so the French occupied Vietnam from 1887 to 1954. Vietnam was a part of a French colony called French Indochina. The Vietnam-U.S. War started in 61 and ended in 75. My parents were born in Cantal, Vietnam in 1950, where they spent their first four years of life under French rule. From 11 to 25 years old, my parents lived through the war. And at 29, they flee Vietnam with a three-year-old daughter. So that's like my process on, again, making the work, like envisioning myself through this journey. So this body of work, Loan Words, was created in 2015, but visually then the work didn't make sense to me. So I went back into my archive to rework this body. Slide. The adaptation of French loan words in Vietnamese, Batung, Baton, Baton, in Vietnamese, French, and English. The three translations of the word appear superimposed on a grayscale image of a formation of police holding batons, which itself is pasted on a color close-up of uniformed people holding batons. Text describes the image. This is entitled baton. So baton, baton, baton. Again, French, Vietnamese, French, English. And when I go into my collages, I give myself really strict rules of is it a two-layered collage? Is it a three-layered collage? Where does the text live? And I feel like by giving myself those rules, I don't trail off into a segue that wouldn't make sense for me. Foreground image, tactical squad marching through park blocks during 1970 student strike. And this here is just the information on a baton, also known as a nightstick and its, and its history. But I'm going to read you this last paragraph here. On May 4th, 1970, members of the Ohio National Guard fired into a crowd of demonstrators at Kent State University. Four people were killed and another nine were wounded. The group was mostly students protesting the Vietnam War and America's intention to expand the conflict by sending troops into neutral Cambodia. Slide. Loan words. Et Chang. Essence. Gasoline. Gasoline in Vietnamese, French, and English. The three translations of the word appear superimposed on a grayscale image of a Buddhist monk pouring gasoline onto a monk calmly kneeling, 
which itself is pasted on a color image of the same scene, but engulfed in flames. Text describes the image. This image is entitled Exxon Essence Gasoline. Um, Vietnamese, French, and English for the word gasoline. Uh, quote, no news picture in history has generated so much emotion around the world as that one, JFK. So this image here is a very uh, famous image. Uh, this is Thich Quan Duc. He was a Vietnamese Mah Mahayana Buddhist monk who burned himself to death at a busy Saigon Road intersection on the 11th of June, 63. He was protesting the persecution of Buddhists by the South Vietnamese Roman Catholic government. Duc is doused with gasoline while calmly sitting down in the traditional Buddhist meditative lotus position, photographed by Malcolm Brown. So there are, I feel like there are about five of these collages so far. I needed to take a break from them because it was just overwhelming research. So a lot of my works are works in progress, but the idea is fully there, it's fully finished. Slide. Another collage briefly appears. Skip to that one. Slide. T-Rex Scape, Terrorscape, 2020. Two collages, side by side. Each has a photo of a colored gas cloud pasted onto green forested landscape. Text describes chemical warfare. I'm going to segue into this body of work that I created um, last summer in June, entitled Terrorscape, Terrorscape. <clears throat> This touches on weapons of warfare used on the landscape globally. Tear gas was first used in World War I in chemical warfare. In 1925, the Geneva Convention categorized tear gas as a chemical warfare agent and banned its use during wartime, but its use by police in the US is still legal. And these are just the titles of each piece. And they're numbered by, the, by um, when they were finished. So the, this image on the left was the first from this body of work entitled Jungle Orange Green. Image on the right is entitled Green Monster. And this is a two-layered image. The background image is um, a straight photo and the foreground image are appropriated images of uh, tear gas that I found online. Slide. Two more collages, very similar to the previous two, except the gas is a different color. Text describes tear gas. Today, tear gas is the most commonly used form of what's known in law enforcement jargon as less lethal force. Journalists file news stories of tear gas deployment so regularly that pictures of smoke-filled streets have come to feel like stock photography, a theatrical backdrop of protests. Banyan blue, palm orange. Slide. Two more collages, very similar to the previous two, except the gas is a different color. Image on the left, purple haze. Image on the right, white. So this body of work was actually <clears throat> a response to a video that I saw during the BLM uprisings in LA. And it was this video from downtown LA where there were protesters and they were kind of like trapped against a fence. They, were, they had nowhere to go, but they were being like horribly tear gassed. There was just like so much smoke everywhere. They were being tear gassed by the police. And um, I wanted to, I didn't want to envision that in a landscape, but thinking about my practice where I do talk a lot about my Vietnamese Americanness, like what would that look like in a landscape? So thinking about those folks in downtown LA being gassed in the city, and then thinking about the families that were gassed in their like home provinces and like small towns in Vietnam. And this body of work emerged from those concepts. Slide. Faux Escape, 2020. Ongoing. <clears throat> Text describing the title. Faux Escape, 2020. Ongoing. All of my works are ongoing until I stop working on them. So, okay, this is the statement for Faux Escape. San Diego, Boston, Berlin, Sydney, Hawaii, Paris. Ottawa. The Vietnamese diaspora has established communities in every corner of the world. Some live their new lives as though they were still there. Others preserve more of a distance to their lives before exile. The reopening of the country, Vietnam, at the beginning of the 90s, many of the Viet Q, as the people who left are called in their home country, have made the return journey. However, many still shrink back from returning, from the confrontation between their memories and the reality of the country. 
from the rich of seeing their memories contradicted at every street corner, or of reawakening other memories carefully buried. Slide. Two images. In each, a faux restaurant is photoshopped into a green jungle landscape. So this body of work was actually sponsored by um, Nikon. Like, I don't get sponsored ever. Um, but there was a branding company in L.A. They saw my work. They reached out and they wanted to like Nikon had this Z creators and they wanted to rebrand Nikon. I made sure I sent an email back. Are you sure this is the type of work that Nikon is looking for? Because I don't sh only shoot straight photos. I make collages. So yeah, they are like, yes, we are looking for new voices. We are looking for new folks. Let's collaborate. So I got a stipend. They sent me a camera and I made this body of work, which is still in the realm of my voice but these images are non-appropriated. They are sh all shot through a Nikon Z. So image here on the left, Photoscape Saigon Blue. Image on the right, Photoscape Cafe Plus Purple. So this is a two-layered collage. And these images of the photo um, storefronts were all photographed here in Koreatown, Los Angeles, and also uh, Westminster, which has a, a huge Vietnamese population. Um, but this body of work is ongoing because I feel like once, <coughs> excuse me. Slide. Two more images of the neon signs in a faux storefront window are photoshopped into a jungle landscape. Text describes the cultural impact of faux restaurants. Once the world opens back up, um, I plan to travel to like little Saigons or little Hanoi's throughout the world. Um, I did a Google map. A Google image map search in the Czech Republic and there is a little Hanoi plaza in a small city within the Czech Republic so I feel like again this body of work is ongoing because we are everywhere <clears throat> so as a child of refugee immigrants our livelihood was built upon faux shops and restaurants a meld of my upbringing food culture land and environment I have fond memories of many birthday parties at my parents' faux restaurant as a kid in San Diego. This stacked scape flattens moments and environments into a reimagined landscape. Slide. Two more images of faux restaurants photoshopped into jungle landscapes. And this body of work came from, I think it was a late night, a late night thought of how, how did pho happen? Who was the originator of this broth? And then I envisioned this person in a hut in the jungle, just kind of like throwing together these ingredients and boiling water and pho magically became a thing. So again, this is me re-envisioning those moments, built like building that bridge between the past and the present. Slide. Two more faux restaurant collages. Fifth four, red, white, blue, and yummy, yummy, red. Slide. Influence. Family Archive, from San Diego and Vietnam. A photo of four children posing for the camera on a sandy beach. Text describes the artist's childhood. Okay, so we're going to move on. We're going to move on to a lot of candid family images. So the, this is, this is going to be cute. Okay. Influence, influence. I always get this question of like, how do you make the work? I don't know, it just comes. It just comes and I just run with it. So influence, my family archive from San Diego uh, to Vietnam. And I have this image on my fridge now. And I always think that it's such a funny image. Um, and to me, it was funny then eating these bun knees, which is a Vietnamese sandwich on the beach in San Diego is because uh, I always felt like I wanted more Americanized things like nachos or hot dogs or things like that, but I didn't realize what I was missing until I went back into the archive to take a look at my childhood where my parents were um, doing their best and trying to like figure out how to raise Vietnamese American kids in America. So this image here is, um, this is my younger brother. This is myself here with the red barrettes, my older sister, and this is our family friend. Mission Beach, San Diego, 1987. Slide. 
A photo of a family eating at a cafeteria-style table. A small child in the foreground holds a can of Coke. Text describes the image. My parents also owned a pho restaurant in the mid-80s, early 90s in San Diego, where there was a large Vietnamese community, a lot of like partying, drinking, laughing, just like coming together. A lot of beer, a lot of Budweiser, Sunkiss, Roasted Pig. Uh, this is myself here in the foreground, circa 1984. This person here with the striped top is my mom. Text. City Heights, a.k.a. East San Diego, South Dakota, 1988. Estimated 37,606 Vietnamese Americans in San Diego, 2016. Ranked number four in the nation. Two images. On the left, a man with a mustache smiles in front of a wall of movie posters. On the right, a faux restaurant. A caption describes the image. Uh, I grew up in a city called City Heights, also known as East San Diego. Um, and I didn't realize, again, that it was ranked number four in the nation of having like the most Vietnamese Americans in, in the United States. So this image on the left is a, an image of my dad. And this is in front of an Asian cinema in City Heights. And this was an image of my dad's pho restaurant grand opening March 4th, 1988. Slide. Family portraits, San Diego, Vietnam. Similarities and differences in environments, same same but different. Two images of families posing for the camera. On the left, the family stands on the side of a road. On the right, the family stands among trees. Captions describe the image. Family portrait, San Diego to Vietnam. Just uh, making note on the similarities and differences within environments and like questioning everything as an adult now trying to like figure out how we landed in the States and why I am here now making this work. So this is a portrait of my family here on the left, San Diego State, 1982. This is a image uh, of my uncle, um, my mom's younger brother and his family, same time frame, okay? So this is uh, myself here being held as a baby and this is my cousin, and we're the same age, but the image is completely, to me, it just feels so detached. I didn't understand all of this, like, foliage. It didn't make sense to me. Um, the clothes didn't make sense to me. There was, like, a lot of photos of my extended family, Vietnam, barefoot, and I just thought that it was such a vintage old image, but it was around the same time period. Slide. 1982 family portrait. SD slash ants VN two images. On the left, a family leaning on a car. Mom, self, sister. On the right, a family posing in a field. Sisters, ants number six, seven, eight, baby, five. Slide. 1988. Now. San Diego, Vietnam. An image of the web search bar. What is Vietnamese drinking and eating with friends called? A paragraph describes the definition of now. Two images below. On the left, a large family gathers inside near a covered table. On the right, a large family encircles a table outside, with trees in the background. So for, for, this, for this lecture, um, I never knew how to describe this word, which is nyao. Nyao. <laughs> what is Vietnamese drinking and eating with friends and family called? And I just always remember this word because as a kid, my dad would say, oh, our friends are going to come over to Nhao. And I had no idea what that meant. Um, even when I would visit Vietnam, my family members, we like to gather. It's a huge family. Everyone cooks. There's a lot of beer drinking. Um, so now I can kind of like share this information with you all. Again, image on the left, San Diego. Image on the right, my uncles in Vietnam. Slide. San Diego slash Vietnam. Two images, captioned. On the left, a small family beside an indoor table. Candid of my family. On the right, a slightly larger family gathered around a circular table. Candid of my aunts in Cano, Vietnam. Slide. Three photos. Top left, a woman at a sewing machine. Mom sewing, 1983, San Diego. Bottom left, two children in a cornfield. Sister and self, 1988, Kansas. On the right, Mom, older sister, and self, 1982, San Diego. They pose in front of a boombox. A yellow flag with red stripes hangs on the wall. So my mom was a seamstress um, 
like most of my life. And a lot of our clothes were sewn, like hand sewn by my mom. Uh, bottom left image of, is a candidate of my sister and myself. And we had a lot of matching outfits. And I used to be so embarrassed, but it, it made sense, you know, like it was cheap. We needed to save money. And now like looking back on it, like I would wear that. That looks like great loungewear. I would wear that at home. It looks cozy. It's probably cotton. It's good for your skin. But I think as a kid, you're just like so embarrassed of like, I wasn't like embarrassed of my culture. It wasn't that. It's just like, I didn't know what my culture was. Image on the right. Um, in every home we lived in in San Diego, it, my dad would hang this flag, which is a South Vietnamese flag, a South Vietnamese freedom flag um, for all of the South Vietnamese people. And I didn't realize what that was until I went back into the archive to like do that research and kind of like teach myself that information. Slide. 1988 San Diego, Vietnam. Two images of children smiling. On the left, the children stand in front of a house. A toy car sits on the lawn nearby. On the right, the children kneel on the side of a river. Slide. Two images. On the left, a man poses with his family in a kitchen. On the right, a man poses with his family in front of a wooden door frame. So this is how the work happens. I sit. I look through images. I ask a lot of questions. I talk to my parents. I ask them about their journey, what it was like back home. Slide. Dad San Diego, Grandfather's Vietnam. Two images. On the left, a color photo of a man posing on a neighborhood corner. On the right, a scratch sepia toned image of two men posing. Portrait of my dad, portrait of my grandfathers. Slide. Mom San Diego, Grandmother Vietnam, posing in front of structures, homes. Two images. On the left, a woman stands on her porch in front of a house on a block. On the right, a woman stands in front of a large gate. Image on the left, mom posing in front yard in front of structures. This is my mom's mom here on the right. Slide. Text, mom SD slash ant number 5, Dinam, VN2 images. On the left, a woman poses clutching a tree trunk in a tree garden. On the right, a woman poses with a scooter in an alley. Image of my mom in the, on the left in San Diego. Uh, also, living in a lot of apartments in San Diego, my dad would build all of these like structures to grow vegetables and it would just grow. So uh, I feel like a lot of Vietnamese people have that like green thumb to just grow anything anywhere. Slide. 1982 SD slash VN self and mom, aunts and friends washing dishes in the yard, noticing differences in American and Vietnamese culture. Two images. On the left. A woman holds a baby. On the right, a dozen people sit washing dishes in large tubs outside. Slide. Mom SD slash ants number 5 and 6, D5 and 6, Vietnam, comparing the similarities in posing. On the left, a color image of a woman sitting sideways with her knee up holding a child on the lawn in front of a house. On the right, a grayscale image of two women sitting back to back with their knees up. Again, a lot of just researching and a lot of looking. A lot of looking at portraits, candids, foliage. Slide. 1977 Vietnam slash 1980 San Diego. On the left, captioned, a portrait of mom and older sister, taken by my dad in Vietnam. On the right, captioned, candid of mom, dad, and older sister in San Diego. Everyone poses facing the camera, smiling. So my dad was a portrait photographer in Saigon before the fall. Um, and when the fall happened, the Viet Cong took over his portrait studio. And, and then like naturally, uh, my parents fled to, uh, on boat to, I think they like fled to like Malaysia, to Canada, to California. So when we um, settled in San Diego, my dad still picked up a camera and that's, why we have like so many, that's why we have like so many candidates of uh, my childhood, which is really fortunate because there are a lot, a lot of other Vietnamese American people my age that don't have the luxuries of looking back into their archive. Slide. Refugee camp on Baidong Island, Malaysia, 1978. A torn photograph, front on back. On the front, a woman sits on porch steps holding a small child. On the back is handwritten non-English text. So in terms of also like influence, yes, the candid images really influence and like sparked curiosity. 
But I think this is like the number one image that sparked curiosity for me was this single image here that I have. I actually, I have this uh, framed in my home. And this image is of my mom and my older sister. And this is an image of them at a refugee camp in Malaysia in 1978. And on the back of this image, it reads in Malaysia. So from there, I assume that this was a portrait of, again, my sister and my mom in Malaysia. And um, yeah, I would go back and ask my parents about you know, their journey. And then from there, I would reconstruct a visual narrative on how to tell this oral story that my parents have given me. Slide, airmail. On the left, two postcards with handwritten text. On the right is a Google image of a house behind a hedge. Yeah, it's a lot. I do a lot of research and it's just, you know, you just learn so much about yourself. So here uh, is a postcard that is uh, addressed to my dad. And this was when they were sponsored by a church in White, White Rock, Canada. And um, this was dated February 26, 1980. It reads, Dear everyone, greetings from Barbados, where it's warm and sunny, 85 degrees. I swim in the sea every day and really enjoying it. We'll be back in White Rock around 8th of March. Hope all is well with you and that you are keeping well and learning English fast. Susie. So Susie was, was my parents' host person. Um, I went... I. <laughs> Before the pandemic, I went to Vancouver for the first time. And Vancouver is about like an hour from White Rock. And um, I Googled the image. I went to go look at the house. I drove in front of the house and I just sat there for a second. But it was just way too dark, way too late for a stranger to knock on a stranger's door. So I'll leave that to another time. It would just be another body of work. But again, I think this is just so important in terms of like research. We would get a lot of uh, we would get a lot of airmail with this like specific envelopes, and I thought like every person in America had these envelopes, but it was just really like um, specific to families that had families overseas. I didn't realize that as a kid. Okay, slides left. Okay, fifty-five slides. Ten, fifteen more slides. Slide. Dad and mom taken in dad's portrait studio in Kano, Vietnam. Two grayscale headshots of smiling people. Okay, portrait of my father, portrait of my mom. Slide. Portrait bomb, 2018 to 2020. Mother Lotus, father chrysanthemum. The same headshots, but now the faces are covered with flowers. This is, this is a body of work inside of portrait bomb. Image on the left, mother Lotus. Image on the right, father chrysanthemum. <coughs> so there's a huge collaboration with the archive, my dad's archive, and kind of like repurposing those images. Slide portrait bomb. Agent bomb, 2019. Two images. On the right, a portrait of a woman. On the left, the same image, but the face is obscured by four planes flying, leaving a trail of gas behind them. This one's entitled Agent Bomb. On the left, image on the right is the original portrait of my mom. Slide. Two images. The portrait of the woman is the same. The other image is the original image that the planes were taken from. Text describes the plane. So the image that was appropriated is four ranch hand C-123 aircraft spraying liquid Agent Orange defoliant in South Vietnam. Slide. Portrait bomb. Field bomb. 2019. On the right, a grayscale image of a girl smiling. On the right, the same image. The face is obscured by a bomb blast. Portrait bomb, field bomb. Slide. World Wars, 2019 to 2020. A collage. Several grayscale photos are superimposed onto one another. One is an image of a woman with a pained look on her face with her three children. Another is a photo from earlier, a woman on the grass with her knee up. Text describes the collage. There's this body of work entitled World Wars, which I created in 2019-20. Um, and it layers documentations of families, soldiers, and individuals in Vietnam during the war with family photographs of my own mother and siblings. The cumulative effect of this imagery evokes the importance of personal and collective remembrance. By digitally rebuilding temporal and historical disruptions, I comment on the idea of home, displacement, separation, and how we embrace and conquer loss. Tragic and poetic composites unravel narratives and place my Vietnamese American perspective into a contemporary landscape. 
This image here is personally entitled World War Mothers. Background image, single mother with her three children in between boat rescue. Slide. World War Apartment, 2019. On the right, a mom and daughters after being rescued from a naval ship. It is the background image of the collage on the left, which is covered by a photo of a family smiling. This one is entitled World War Apartment. Mom and daughters after being rescued from a naval ship. Slide. World War Backyard. The image on the right, military in a field surrounded by smoke, is the background image of the collage on the left, covered by a family photo from earlier. World War Backyard. U.S. military in a field of color-coded pink smoke. Slide. World War Beach. Two images on the right, captioned, serve as the background for the collage on the left, which is covered by a photo of the artist's family smiling on a beach. World War Beach. Top image. Vietnamese family hiding from gunfire. Bottom image. Military coming upon shore with weapons. Slide. Home. Faux family album. 2011 to 2019. An image of five women smile in a yard in front of a house. Text describes the image. I think this is going to be the last body of work that I'm going to show or talk about. <sighs> so, this body of work is entitled Home Faux Family Album. And I started this in 2011 uh, while in grad school. But it did, my advisors were not into this. Uh, I was working on another body of work that I needed to, I like hit a wall with the other body of work, so I needed to take a break. I started on this new body of work just to like dump some, like process some information. Um, yeah, it didn't sit well with them. I stopped working on the work. Then I re-picked up the work back in 2019. Um, in this body of work home, I created a series of faux family portraits. I scanned in old family photographs of my relatives in Vietnam and paired them with images of family homes I photographed throughout Los Angeles. By doing this, I'm fabricating a substitute family photo album thinking of the many displaced families and individuals that have escaped in search of asylum. The language in my work touches on separation and, and bridges the question of what came before and what's to follow. Slide. Family Portrait I, 2011. Two images. On the right is a family posing in front of a house in Vietnam. On the left, the family has been superimposed in front of an American suburban house, behind a white picket fence. So I don't share the original candidates often. Uh, so image on the right is the original candid. And I love that like in every culture, we have our family photos in front of like the home, in the yard, in front of a structure. Slide. Sister I, 2011. On the right, an original photo of women posing in Vietnam. On the left, the same women are now superimposed in front of an American suburban house. This is my grandmother in the center with her sisters. Slide. Family Portrait 3, 2019. On the right, a Vietnamese family posing. On the left, the same family, now superimposed in front of an American suburban house. Slide. Grandparents, 2011. On the right, a grayscale image of a Vietnamese couple. On the left, they are superimposed in front of an American suburban house. These are my uh, maternal grandparents. Slide. Research and Influence, Films, Books, and Artists. A text box lists influence. An image shows a stack of books. There are, Sigh, Gone, Minor Feelings, The Refugees, Even the Women Must Fight, On Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous, The Best We Could Do, Vietnam America, and Women Who Run With the Wolves. Okay, so influence, influence. Uh, I just wanted to share this like stack of books as like my current influence influences um, and I feel as an artist when I was a new artist just like making work I didn't realize that there it didn't feel like there were like a lot of Vietnamese American artists making work but now I see that there are more emerging so here are a few um, artists creatives that influence my work uh, TV graphic novelist Ocean Vuong writer Viet Tan Nguyen, writer, uh, Quinn Nguyen Lee, young, film, young Vietnamese filmmaker. And I came across this young Vietnamese French collage artist, Prune Phi, in social media. Uh, the current films that I think about often are In the Mood for Love. I think the cinematography is just so beautiful. Um, current, current, current film, Minari. Um, I love a good coming of age drama. Slide. Thank you. Two images. On the left, a woman and a young girl 
who holds balloons from 1982. On the right, the same women embrace, 2020. This is my last slide. This is an image of myself and my mom last year in La Jolla. And this is an image of myself and my mom um, from 1982 at San Diego State. So I'm going to... I'm going to end my share. The video feed of the four speakers. And I'm curious to know, um, how is your family comfortable? I assume they are. But are they comfortable with the fact that you use their archives and use their likeness and their images and your work? Or have you ever bumped up to uh, up against any sort of tension over that issue? Anla. I feel like when my mom and my dad first saw my work in a postcard, it was for a show and they didn't, they didn't understand what was happening because it's not like a traditional image. It's like an image that has been manipulated. So at first they're questioning, why is this mass produced? <laughs> why is this mass produced? Uh, they questioned, why is it important? Um, I think the huge part of it was just confusion, right? And I think my parents' generation where they like, came to America to like survive. And now like they're the next generation, which is my generation, we do have that luxury to like research and make the work. So I don't think there are like any heads that are bumped. It's more so I need to, I've sat down with them. I have to like slowly tell them what I do. And there's also a language barrier. My Vietnamese is not all that great and their English is not all that great. So I had to like slowly tell them, hey, this is my practice. Uh, this is what I teach. This is what I talk about. It's important because there's not, not a lot of people are talking about this now. And if I don't talk about it, then it might be like lost in the next generations. So I think right now in terms of, are they okay with seeing their likeness out in the world? I think right now it's neutral. I think I will always have that conversation with them on like why I'm using the archive. The video feed of the four speakers. Something in the chat from Cindy, I can read that. The World War images remind me of uh, Martha, or I'm gonna say this wrong. Oh no, Martha Rolser with uh, the mixing of war and domestic imagery. Do you consider your work in conversation with the history of feminist art? Anla. Yeah, Cindy, I think so. I think so. I think there are a few works that do touch on the history of feminism and also like the political nature of work. But also, again, I'm thinking about my mom a lot when I make the work. So it's going to always have that, um, that sentiment. So yes. Rebecca Trawick. You mentioned that you have visited Vietnam. Um, at least once, right? Probably more. Um, but how I, how has, you know, I think it's interesting how you talked about the fact that for a lot of your um, family, you know, the idea of returning is such a mixed bag, you know, it's so full of like fear and trauma and this sort of sadness about the way things have changed. So you are obviously the family historian, in addition to being an artist, um, you're obviously very connected um, to the family archives. So I, I'm curious to know if you had any of that same kind of reaction, um, you know, when when you went back. I know you, you you didn't have those memories necessarily, but you're still carrying that imagery with you. So I'm curious to know what that experience was like. Anla. My first trip back to Vietnam was, I think, in 2004, 2005. Um, and... I definitely did want to go back, but there are other chances to go back as a teenager, but I don't know why I was fighting the 15 hour flight as a teenager. So I didn't go the first time around, but my first trip in the early 2000s, like I didn't have any expectations, right? Um, and I wanted to like understand more of the culture and my family and like how they couldn't flee or they couldn't leave. And now they're just, they're not stuck. I don't want to call it stuck because they love their lives there, you know? Um, but I think as the next generation, we are so curious on what it's like, like what is our homeland? Like what is the motherland? Like, what does it smell like? Uh, how will people perceive you? 
So as a curious person, I was kind of like open to all of that information with like open arms, like I'm going to embrace everything and like take a lot of notes. But I think that first time back, I wasn't really making collages. I was, um, port I, took, I took a lot of portraits, right, of my family and like a lot of images of landscape. But um, I've been back uh, a total of three times and I feel like every time I'm like learning more and more about the space. Um, but I think like for my parents, it was just hard for them because they like lived through all that, you know? Um, and also like talking to um, my peers that are the same age that are talking about this type of information in their artworks, their parents feel the same way. Like they never want to go back because they have like this idea of what it was when they left. So the change was really hard for them. The change was hard for my dad. He was very like um, mad. Uh, there are like certain words that you can't say, like the, you can't say, you shouldn't say Viet Cong in Vietnam because it's supposed to be negative. So you're supposed to call them the police, right? And my dad was like, they're not the police. Like they harmed us, they are the Viet Cong. So it's hard to go back with my dad because he will cause ruckus, right? And we have to like be there to like, okay, dad, like, we don't want you to get stuck here. We, you need to come back to the States after our holiday is over. So there are a lot of things that are happening. Andrew Hadel. I have a question for you. Um, yeah, so like you, many of our students are first generation college students. Um, is there any advice that you could share with our students um, who might be interested in pursuing a career in the arts? Anla. <laughs> I'm kind of like <laughs> I'm torn here. Um, I think I think if you want to pursue a career in the arts, yes, do it. Um, ah, I can't say like form a voice sooner than later because like it would be great if I formed my voice sooner than later because then I'd be like projected by now. But I feel like this projection is like on on time for me now, right? But I feel like as a first gen, do it, right? Um, do a lot of writing, do some research, talk to your elders, um, make fun work, right? I feel like this work doesn't, from an outsider's point of view, it might not look fun because it's a lot of like sadness, but it's really fun for me to like deconstruct all of this history and like reconstruct it to my like visual liking, right? So I'm like, remaking history right now that can be in like art history books. So I think, yes, those first gen students, what do you wanna talk about? Let's talk about it and like, let's make it great. Um, also don't stress yourselves out about money, right? Like look for that financial aid, this is real, right? Look for, for that financial aid, there are grants out there and scholarships. But I think like the number one thing is like, do what you want respectfully. Rebecca Trawick. So you talked about how the work is fun but earlier, you know, you also talked about how it's, you know, it's like heavy, heavy stuff. It's like heavy, you know, you're heavy lifting in the work. So um, I don't know if I'm going to articulate this well, but I'm curious, like, how do you take care of yourself in creating this work that is so powerful and heavy? Anla. That's a really good question. So the fun part of this is I'm learning a lot about myself, right? Where I am naturally a crier, like I cry a lot in critiques. I cried a lot in undergraduate and graduate studies. And like, I've grown comfortable <laughs> with that. Like, I'm just gonna cry, it's happening, right? It's gonna happen, I'm just gonna let it go and then it'll pass. So as I'm making the work that will initially happen. And I think it's, it's strange where the, the, I go through these, these moments where it's like, I'm really sad, I'm really mad, I'm really angry. And then that makes the work really great. So I like channel that energy. Um, but the that is exhausting. You know, you're dehydrated. You don't want to like turn on the computer to make the work. So for me, I had there's a lot of downtime where I'm just like sitting. I get I text this a lot to a lot of my friends. Hey, they're like, hey, what are you doing? And it's like night, <laughs> like 8 p.m. The sunset. So I'm just sitting on the couch in the dark with the candle lit. They're like, is that, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, I'm great. So I think it's like my form of meditation where I'm just like in complete silence or um, I go to a lot of bars. Um, I drink a lot of cocktails. 
when the world opens again or prior to the pandemic, I would go see a lot of art. I think that really helps flesh out a lot of my like information that I'm going through. Um, I go on like a lot of holidays. So there is like a huge, like a huge aspect of me like dumping that uh, energy that I'm putting into the work. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about this a bit more where I was on the phone with someone and they asked the same question. They're like, how do you, do you seek therapy or counseling? And my response was like, no, because I put it into the work. And then he brought up David Lynch. And he says, David Lynch doesn't seek, seek therapy or counseling because he feels like that's going to kill the work, right? And then I'm just sitting there on the phone like, But, you know, I could be wrong. I can seek therapy and counseling and like my work can like segue to like a higher, it's higher platform. But yeah, there's a, there's this other side where I like zen out when I'm out in the world. I like zen out my brain. I like think about nothing. I'm in the present moment. But when I'm doing the work, it's like 100% in the work. Andrew Hadel. Uh, speaking of your work and things being heavy. <laughs> Uh, this past year has been kind of challenging. I mean, with the pandemic, obviously, racial upheaval, unrest, um, you know, the emerging public health crisis will definitely outlast where we're at now with COVID. Um, how has the past year changed your studio practice? Um, I wonder if you're willing to dive into that. Anla. I also teach college. So it's, um, what are we, 2021? I think that my Zoom, being on a computer with students and Zooming is a lot of work. It's like way more work than a lot of people think it is. Um, and then getting on the same computer to try to make the work is hard because I don't even want to turn on the computer most days because I'm on, on it all day. So I think it's definitely changed my rigor. Um, I don't get on the computer much as of late. Like this year, I feel like I'll get on if I'm like really upset about something and I need to like flesh out, fl flesh out that energy. But yeah, I think this, this year, the pandemic has made me work less on my practice. Uh, I'm in the same space all day long. So I don't know. I need to like figure that out for myself for like later this year and next year and the following years, but it's, it's difficult to like live in your studio and work in your studio and teach in your studio. So once it's safe to like go back to teaching, I think that dynamic is going to shift for me. Rebecca Trawick. So when thinking about the future, um, I, I know you're talking about how you're not creating at the same level that you once were, but is there anything sort of on the horizon that you could share with us that you have coming up? Yeah. The video feed of the four speakers. Okay, so I should be working on this. I'm not working on this, but I feel like as artists, we're like natural procrastinators and I'll just knock it out. Um, Anla. So fall 2021, I'm going to be in a two person group show at uh, Texas Christian University. They have a contemporary uh, museum on campus with a, another Vietnamese American artist that's based in California. So yeah, we are in the works of like the logistics of uh, accommodations and like if I go for artist lectures or studio visits. Yeah, but right now I am thinking about the work, but I'm not physically making any of the work. But I think, yeah, I have like a year and a half. I think like by fall this year, I'll start like drafting out the work. But that's my one big thing. Uh, I think like for now, it's just like a lot of Zooms that have happened um, and uh, teaching, I'm teaching many courses this fall. So right now is like downtime to just, I'm just relaxing right now. I need to not do anything for maybe like two weeks. The video feed of the four speakers. Good for you. And thinking is a big part of that practice, right? Yeah. It's not given yeah. enough credit. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's hard. It's hard to think about things. 
<laughs> making them is cool because I think like the more you think about them, you're like, okay, I know how to process this. Okay, this is gonna look great. Okay, this makes sense. So I'm not the type of person to like jump into the making. I need to like <laughs> do all of the all of the brain work first. Absolutely. Well, I I have many more questions, but I think we'll have to you and I'll have to chat at another time. We'll have to have you back. Uh, but I want to thank you so much for your time and creativity and energy today and thank everyone who attended today and spent a little bit of their afternoon with us. We appreciate you. The survey screen appears again. So reminder to all of you who are here today, Roman's putting some links in the chat. We'd really appreciate if you take two minutes to do the survey. Rebecca Trawick. Um, thanks, everybody, and please take good care. Anla. Thank you. Have a great day. Stay healthy, please. Stay hydrated. Text and logo, Chafee College. Wignall Museum of Contemporary Art. Home edition, with a graphic of a house.